Good morning. Good morning. When Jesus prayed for his disciples in his high priestly prayer, he prayed, sanctify them in truth. Your word is, is truth. Isn't it good in a world that seems so confused that we know where truth is? Truth is in Jesus Christ. Truth is in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Let us rise now as we're able, as we begin in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no, desire, no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I therefore invite you to take a moment to silently and privately confess before the Lord any sins that might be troubling you at this time. Let us then also publicly confess our sins to God. Most merciful Father, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given us his only Son to die for us, and it is for his sake that he forgives us all of our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I announce to you that the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. power, chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that pursuing what you have promised, we may share your heavenly glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. may be seated. The Old Testament lesson is from Ezekiel. Ezekiel challenges those who think they cannot change because of what their parents were and did, or who think they cannot reverse their own previous behavior. God insistently invites people to turn and live. Ezekiel 18, 1 through 4, and 25 through 32. The word of the Lord came to me, What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Yet you say... The way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, He shall save his life, because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. This is the word of the Lord. We'll say the psalm psalm deed together. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. 
Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. The epistle lesson is from Philippians. As part of a call for harmony rather than self-seeking, Paul uses a very early Christian hymn that extols the selflessness of Christ and his obedient death on the cross. Christ's selfless perspective is to be the essential perspective we share as the foundation for Christian accord. Philippians 2, 1 through 13. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. According to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When he, that is Jesus, entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, well, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said to the the same. And he answered, I go, sir but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes 
are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, O Christ. May be seated. My neighbor has uh, a Jewish man doing some work for him in his shop. And he had to miss last Monday. And he told him that he was going to miss tomorrow. He missed last Monday because of Rosh Hashanah. And he's missing tomorrow because of Yom Kippur. And so my friend asked me, my neighbor asked me, he said, so do Christians celebrate Yom Kippur? So how many of you knew that tomorrow was Yom Kippur? Oh, good. How many of you know what Yom Kippur is? How many of you are celebrating? <laughs> you know, there, there's a whole series of high Jewish festivals that are being celebrated over uh, these weeks. Yosh Hashanah, uh, Yom Kippur, and then the week after that is Sukkoth, or the Festival of uh, Booths. I find these, this series of Jewish holidays very interesting because in them we, we get a picture of Jesus. You know, Luther says, Everything in the Bible points to Jesus. Everywhere in the Old Testament, we find Jesus. In all of the Jew Old Testament Jewish feasts and festivals, they in one way or another pointing to Jesus. And I believe that these three festivals in particular are pointing to Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. Have you heard that phrase before? Prophet, priest priest and king, the threefold office of Jesus. You see, we get a glimpse of those three offices fulfilled in Jesus. Now, through the Old Testament, there were always three characters that were very important in Old Testament Judaism. There was the prophet. Uh, in fact, we have John being referred to as the prophet in our lesson this morning. We have the priest, uh, the high priest, Aaron, and those who followed. And, of course, we had the king, King David, King Solomon, all the other kings. But each of these individuals individually held one of the offices. In Jesus, though, we see these three distinct offices coming together. We kind of get a hint of this in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, where it says in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through prophets, at many times in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. The son is a prophet. He is the prophet whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. By the way, making the universe, that's a, an allusion to him being king as well. The son is the radiance of the God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word word. There's prophet again. After making pur purification for sins, ah, the priest, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, the reference to Jesus as king, prophet, priest, and king. Likewise, in these three festivals of Rosh Hashanah, of Yom Kippur, and then Sukkoth, or test, uh, tabernacles, we see Jesus I get an illusion as Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. In Rosh Hashanah, we, we see Jesus as the king. Now, this is right from the internet here, so I'm not making this stuff up. If it's on the internet, you know it's true, right? So it says Rosh Hashanah is the celebration of the Jewish New York New Year. Um, it is a very important holiday in the Jewish calendar. It is the first of what we call the high holidays or high holy days, a 10-day period 
that ends with Yom Kippur. I, I don't really see, it actually goes on to uh, the Feast of Tabernacles a week later. Now notice this, it says on Rosh Hashanah, Jews from all over the world celebrate God's creation of the world. Now th this is interesting because um, as we're going to see in the, in the next slide, uh, in the scriptures, we, we get a description of when they are to be celebrating uh, Rosh Hashanah. And it's actually the seventh month. Speak to the people of Israel saying in the seventh month on the first day. So we would normally think a new year, year would start when? January. On the first month, right? But here they're celebrating New Year in the seventh month. Why is that? Proclaim it with the blast of trumpets. A holy convocation. You, you see, ironically, the, the Jewish people believe that God created the world at this time. That he began creation in what they celebrate as the seventh month, the first day. And so... Well, they are instructed to celebrate this with the blast of trumpets or the blast of ram's horns. And you'll see that through the, all the fe festivals of the Jewish people, the ram's horn, which is usually associated with the, the coming of the king or the celebration of the king. So the ram's horn God is king. He's created the world. If he's created the world, what does that make him? The ruler over all, right? So in this festival, we see God being celebrated as king because he is the creator of all things. Now, scripture tells us that Jesus is the creator of all things. If the creator is king, that would make Jesus king. Colossians 1 says, for by him, that is Christ Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus is the creator. Now I know that in our catechism classes, we probably learned that the work of the Father is creation and the work of Jesus is redemption and the work of the Holy Spirit is sanctification. But that, that's a learning tool for us to help understand the work of God. But you see, all three persons were involved in creation. This tells us that Jesus is the creator. He is king. Jesus is king. We see this at Rosh Hashanah. But I want to go on to the, the third one, the festival of Sukkoth, or the festival of Beats, because this, here's where we see Jesus as the prophet. So we see in Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verse 33, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the 15th day of the seventh month, seventh month again, we're in the same month, just two weeks after Yosh, Rosh Hashanah, for seventh day is a feast of booths to the Lord. Now this was the most exciting celebration for the Jewish people. This was like Christmas and Thanksgiving and your birthday all rolled into one. This was a time of joy, celebration, high festive times. And, and the people would come into Jerusalem and and to remember this time. Festival of Booths. It was a reminder of the years that they had wandered in the desert going to the promised land. Remember that? So they would go around. How did they travel? They didn't carry homes with them, did they? Well, their homes were tents. And likewise, God, he was in their midst as well, but he resided in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent. Remember, God had instructed Moses on how to build that tabernacle with all the appointments and such like that. And not only did they have then the tabernacle where they knew that God was, but they had the Shekinah glory 
that accompanied them. Do you remember that? It was a cloud by day that would leave the people of Israel. And it was the pillar of fire at night. And whenever they would encamp, that cloud would come over the Holy of Holies and descend into that. And the people knew that that is where God was. God would reside there. God's presence was there. And in Sukkoth, or in the festival of, of booths, they remembered the presence of God, even though they were wandering. In scripture, we are told that Jesus is that presence of God in us. Now, now you go back to that, that very familiar verse in John. Remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What's interesting is the word in the Greek for dwelt among us is the word tabernacled. Jesus, God, tabernacled with us. Jesus is the presence of God. And Jesus is the word. The word of God. He is the one who speaks the word to us. He brings us the word of God. He is the word of God. He's the prophet. He's the one who instructs us in the truth of God. Now, interestingly, <laughs> like I said, this was party time. People loved this. And so it wasn't enough to have seven days of party. So you know what they did? They, they wanted an eighth day. And that is called the Shemini Atzerat, the eighth day of celebration. So they had an eighth day of celebration because they needed more. But that wasn't enough. So in the years following the time of Jesus, they added yet another day. And that was the Shimkat Torah. And the Shimkat Torah, uh, well, the last word there is Torah, the law, the word. They celebrated, that's what Shimkat is, they wanted to have a Jewish celebration, and, and they focused on the word. Because what happened was, through this time, now this is kind of like the beginning of the year, still connected with Yom uh, Rosh Hashanah, and, and now they have this final celebration of this whole festive time. Just like we have a, a uh, liturgical pattern of our lessons, the, the lectionary, you know, we, have, we happen to have a three-year, usually we have a three-year cycle of readings. That way pastors only have to prepare sermons for three years, and then they can just repeat it. <laughs> so they would also have a lectionary, and, and it was a one-year reading from the Torah. And the last reading would happen during Sukkot. And then on the next Sabbath, on Shimkat Torah, they would begin a new series, or they would repeat then the series of reading. Now, to, this is where it gets really interesting. To picture this, they would have somebody designated as the bridegroom. And on uh, Shemini, um, the day before, the bridegroom would walk out with the scrolls, with the Torah. And then on Shemkat Torah, he'd actually come back. Do you, do you get the picture? The bridegroom comes with the word of God. Isn't that Jesus? He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. He's the prophet. He brings us the word of of God. So here again, in the festival of tabernacles, we see a picture of Jesus, this time as prophet. But now we want to get to the one I really want to focus on, the one that we celebrate tomorrow. That is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 
So we look again. Oh, by the way, remember that verse we had in Col Colossians chapter 1 where we saw how Jesus had made everything and that way he is king? The, the, the one verse at the very end, verse 20, says this, and through him, verse 19, for in him God, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus is the priest who is going to offer up the blood as a sacrifice for sins. This is what Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is all about. So we turn back again to, to Leviticus chapter 23, and it says that Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, it said the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the 10th day of this seventh day is the day of atonement. It shall be a time of holy conversation. Verse 28, you shall not do work of any on that very day, for it is a day of atonement. It is a day in which it really is focused around two goats. Two goats that are going to be the sacrifice. Now understand, it's not going to be two sacrifices. The two goats make up one sacrifice together. We hear about this more completely in Leviticus chapter 16. It says, And he shall take from the congregation the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering. For a sin offering. The two are one. And Aaron will cast lost over the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the lot for Azazel, or, or for the scapegoat. So get the picture. The high priest, Aaron, he takes these two goats, cast lots. Okay, this one's for the Lord. This is going to be the offering. This one is the scapegoat. Oh, no, go back to the other one still, I think. Okay. And he will present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azel will be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. We'll, we'll get back to that part again. But the, 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 there are two functions for one sacrifice. So, first, the sin offering, the, the one for the Lord. So now it goes on to say, that he will then kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring the blood inside the veil that is inside the Holy of Holies, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So the high priest, now understand, the high priest serves for one year. That's it. This is one day, the only day in the year that someone can go into the Holy of Holies. Remember how the temple is configured. You have the outer court all around. Then you have the temple itself. In the temple, you have the main section, which is the holy place. And then you have one smaller section, the Holy of Holies, divided by this great veil, uh, the veil that's four inches thick. And in that Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the story of Indiana Jones and how he found it? You know, okay. So you have the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant are, are all the holy things, like Moses' staff, and, and like the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, and, and like a, a jar holding manna that they had received during their pilgrimage. So this was a very... And then on top of that Ark was what was called the mercy seat. The lid was fashioned in such a way, it, it was in the kind of a picture of an angel, but with the, the wings of that coming up and forming the back that looked like a, a chair. And that was where God resided. That was where God would sit in judgment. And this is where the high priest would come once a year. Now imagine, if he only gets to do it once a year, if he only gets to do it once in his lifetime, this is an exciting time for this guy, right? And to get to be high priest, you probably have to be one of the older guys, right? So, do you see where this is going? So you have this older guy 
who's going into the most amazing, most exciting, most dramatic time of his entire life. And he's going to go into a room where only he can go and no one can go for another year. So what is everyone afraid of? Yeah. <laughs> is he going to get so excited he has a heart attack and keels over? So before he goes in, you know what they do? They put little bales all around his robe. Tinkle, tinkle, tinkle. Why? So they can make sure he's still moving. And then they tie a rope around his waist. Why is that? So if they, yeah, if they don't hear the little tinkle, 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 they can pull him out. Because if he died in there and they couldn't get him out, they'd have to wait until next year, right? And if they waited until next year, oh man, it would not be a pretty picture. So all of this is going on. And the high priest goes in taking the blood. He's made the, blood, the sacrifice out in the outer court on the great altar of God. He takes the blood and he goes into the Holy of Holies. The only time he's ever going to see that in his entire life. And he takes it and spl sprinkles it onto the mercy seat. Now, what's the picture? Do you get the picture? You see, when God is sitting on his mercy seat and he's looking out at the people, what is he looking through? The blood of the Lamb. Do you remember the, ever heard of somebody being described as somebody who looks at the world through rose-colored glasses? If someone looks at the world through rose-colored glasses, how do they see things? Rosy. <laughs> Everything's rosy. Okay. If God looks through the blood of the Lamb and he looks at you, how does he see you? He sees you covered with the blood of the lamb and has mercy upon you because you are now forgiven because you're covered with the blood of the lamb. This is why this is the day of atonement when your sins have been atoned for. That's part of it. Then the other part. The other part is that scapegoat. And so then when he's finished making the atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting, he will present the live goat. He will lay his hands on the hands of the live goat. So he goes out and he lays on it. Ceremonially, he then confesses over all the sins of the people, and he's putting all the sins of the people on the head of the goat. Now this takes place not in the temple, not in the temple court, but this takes place outside the city gate, outside the people. And there he lays the sins on the goat, and then he shoes the goat away into the wilderness. And this symbolizes or demonstrates that as far as that goat has been removed from the people, so far their sins have been removed as well. Two important images here. First of all, on this day, your sins have been taken away so far, they're no longer even close to you. And God, when he looks at you, he sees you through the blood of the Lamb. This is a direct picture of Jesus, more than a picture of Jesus. You see, Jesus fulfills this for us exactly. Jesus is the perfect, perfect sacrifice that is made for us to atone for sin. He is both goats in one. When he is crucified, where is he crucified? Outside the gate. Remember? He had to be taken outside the city walls so that he could fulfill that goat's position. But then we're told that he also... Now, this is what's interesting, is that he actually takes his blood. He takes his sacrifice and lays it before God's throne. By the way, there's one other thing you should remember. When Moses was up on Mount Sinai and he received the instructions on how to build the tabernacle, what then was copied in the temple when it was built, 
when he was up there receiving that, God said, be careful to make it exactly according to the pattern that I will show you. In other words, excuse me, when Moses built the tabernacle, he was using it a pattern of what he had seen. John saw the same thing in the book of Revelation. They both looked up into heaven and they saw the heavenly throne room. There's the seat of God. There's the veil. That is, we're not God. We're separated from him. All the accruements that are in the holy place, the, the seven-stemmed light stand, the, the menorah, the table with the, set, the 12 bread, uh, loaves of bread, the bowl of incense uh, with prayers of people light rising up, those are all in heaven, in, in the spiritual realm. And this is an exact representation of that. So when Jesus provides the sacrifice, he doesn't go to the earthly tabernacle or temple, but he goes into the heavenly tabernacle or temple. It says this in Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as high priest, here we have scripture specifically calling Jesus our high priest, of the good things that have come, he then went through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy place, the holy of holies, not by the means of bloods of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Do you see what Jesus has done? He has exactly fulfilled the sacrifice of Yom Kippur. He has become the day of atonement. Now, what are we saying by all of this? It goes back to our epistle reading for this morning about the humiliation and exaltation of Christ. But I want to look at that last part of verse 8 where it says that he became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He became obedient. Obedient to what? He became obedient to God's plan of salvation. You see, all of these festivals and this particular arrangement of, arrangement of Rosh Hashanah and then Yom Kippur and then the Festival of Tabernacles, this was not just some accidental arrangement of times of celebrations, but rather this was God's perfect picture of the salvation that he would be providing in Jesus Christ. They are pictures of what Jesus would be and what he would do for us. That he would be our prophet, he would be our priest, he'd be our king. He'd be the one who'd bring us the word of God. He'd be the one who offered up the sacrifice and made the sacrifice for us because he is our God. So, you know, what I think the real question is, not do Christians celebrate, can Jews celebrate Yom Kippur? This is what's funny. Can Jewish people celebrate Yom Kippur? No. Why not? Because they don't have the altar upon which to sacrifice. They don't have the Holy of Holies, to take in and sprinkle the blood. No longer can Jewish people observe their high holiday, holidays because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. They have no place to make their sacrifices. You know, they can't make it down in the big arena. They, they can't make it in the synagogue. They have to only make it in one place, and that's in Jerusalem, at the tabernacle or the temple, which no longer exists. Jews cannot really celebrate Yom Kippur. What they're celebrating is something artificial. Because the, the real thing has already been fulfilled in Jesus. 
So my friend's question was what? Do Christians celebrate Yom Kippur? And the answer is yes. When do we celebrate Yom Kippur? Good Friday. When Jesus died on the cross, when he took his blood into the Holy of Holies of God's eternal kingdom, and he offered it there before him. That's why we call it Good Friday. That is the day of atonement. And yeah, you're right. Every Sunday then, when we receive communion, we are remembering that atonement that has been made for us. And we're being connected back to that, that atonement through the blood of Jesus. So, happy Yom Kippur. <laughs> Amen. Now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, keep and guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen. Please rise. Let us confess the faith of the Church, the faith into which we were baptized. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Let us approach the throne of grace on behalf of the church, the world, and one another. Most Holy Father, thank you for making us your children. Thank you for your patience with us when we speak and act in ways that grieve and displease you. Thank you for your Son, Jesus, who perfectly says and does your will. Make us to be like him, so we are your heart's delight and your blessing to the world. Lord, in your mercy. Conform the church throughout the world to the mind of your dear Son. Conform its proclamation and teaching to his own. Conform its works to his self-sacrificing love. Fashion the church into the image and likeness of Christ into his very body, so that the light of his love shines into the world and many turn to him and live. Lord, in your mercy. Grant strength, perseverance, and charity to our brethren who experience bitter persecution throughout the world. Stir up our hearts to defend and assist them. Soften the hearts of their tormentors so that repentance and true faith in you may grow. Lord, in your mercy. Put the mind of Christ into this congregation. Bless our parish planning board and call committee and fill them with your Holy Spirit to seek and do your will. Let his humility and self-giving love shape and direct our words, worship, service, and fellowship. Give us such willing hearts that we gladly speak and act in obedience to your will, to your glory, and for the building up of your people. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all parents, step-parents, and foster parents. Give them your spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord, and joy in your presence. Forgive their errors, relieve their fears, and grant them joy of seeing their children grow to healthy, loving adults. Lord, in your mercy. Make the world leaders not only of nations, but also of local government and all useful fields of human endeavor into your wise and willing offspring. Teach them your will for guiding those for whom they are responsible. Make all of us honest, wise, and kind. Help us to care for our neighbor, to work for opportunity and harmony in our neighborhood and nation, and live at peace with each other. Lord, in your mercy. Keep in your special care those in the military and all who risk their lives for the sake of others. Inform their minds, strengthen their bodies, purify their hearts, shape their actions, and prosper all they do that is in accord with your will. Bring them home safely and soon, and shield their loved ones with your love. Lord, in your mercy. Bring the joy of your saving help to everyone in distress, sorrow, danger, or need, including those we now name before you. Lead them through the things that afflict and endanger them into the light of your blessed presence and into the joy of restored health, hope, and fellowship with those whom they love. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, dear Father, for the lives of your faithful servants who have been gathered into your eternal kingdom. Especially, we bless you for our departed loved ones. Wipe away the tears of those whose grief grief is raw and deep. Give courage and compassion, wisdom and energy, faithfulness and hope to each of us as we walk our pilgrim's pathway through this life. And bring us safely into your spacious house, where you have have made ample room for everyone whom you have redeemed through the obedient and loving sacrifice of your Son, and where we will delight in praising your goodness forever. Lord, in your mercy. Conform our prayers to the heart of Jesus. Hear them through the interceding of your Holy Spirit and grant them in accordance with your gracious will. Amen. Our offerings are being gathered at the table there at the rear.
uh, we can make those offerings as we come in or as we leave this morning. We now continue as we have the offertory as sung by the, uh, the choir.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer you with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Thanks of your gracious love, receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. praise and thank you, O God, for your infinite goodness that you have created us to receive and rejoice in your love and mercy. In the fullness of time and according to your purposes, you sent your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, born of Mary. He came to proclaim the kingdom, he healed the sick, and numbered himself among sinners. He poured himself out in death, giving his life as our ransom and our righteousness. We remember how our Lord Jesus has given us this special meal. I invite you to take the elements that you have there that they might be consecrated to this holy purpose. We remember our Lord Jesus cried how he took bread and the night he was betrayed and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them and said, take indeed, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this to remember me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Holy Father, as we remember our Lord's life and passion, his resurrection and ascension, give us, we give you our thanks and bless your holy name. Because your Son has made us, his fellow servants, a holy priesthood, a people set apart, we pray. Send now his life-giving spirit upon this bread of life and this cup of blessing, that we and all who partake of Christ's very body and blood may find our unity in him and our lives defined by his cross as we await the final coming as Lord of love. Through him, with him. Now as the many grains of wheat once scattered on the hills have become one in the bread of life, gather your church from every time and every night. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us now, at our Lord's invitation, come around his table to receive his true body and blood. I invite you to take now those elements peeling back that cover over the bread and receive his, what he has promised us. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ. And likewise, peeling back the cover over the wine. We remember Jesus' own invitation. Come, take and drink. This is my blood. Now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting.
Please arise. Almighty God, you provide the true bread from heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant that we who have received the sacrament of his body and blood may abide in him and he in us, that we may be filled with the power of his endless life now and forever. Amen. Announcements for this week. Uh, I think we have a real important one here. Um, I'm Don from the call committee. And for those of you who don't know, we are going to have a pastoral candidate visit with us next Sunday. Um, he will be uh, doing the 8 o'clock, the 1030, and preaching and leading worship and also teaching Bible study. And we're very excited about this. It's going to be a long weekend for him because uh, of meetings with the uh, call committee, meetings with the parish planning board, with the district dean, on top of the worship. Uh, but we're still carving out time for you to spend one-on-one -on -one time with him on Saturday. For those of you who haven't gotten the emails or the letters, Saturday we have a sign-up sheet where small groups can meet with him all day. It'll be a long day, but we really feel it's important that every disciple get an opportunity to spend time with him. I see here quite a few people who still have not signed up. And as they used to say, if you don't get your permission slip in, you can't go on the trip. <laughs> so please, if you have, some people have had trouble, but they've called me. If you want me to walk you through it right now after service, come to me and I'll sign you up. Uh, we had limited the spots to 10 to make them small groups, but we've opened it up. If a group fills up, come to me, we'll get you in there. It's very, very important that everybody meets, spend time with him because it's a big decision for both the pastor and for us. Uh, we ask you to continue uh, confidentiality as we worship and meet with him uh, because the decision is really going to be between him, us, and the Holy Spirit, not the outside world. So we need to keep it in there. A couple of things when we do meet with him. Uh, I have to, I've told him a few things about us that might have stretched a little bit. Uh, I've told him that there are no such thing as hurricanes. That that's just type. <laughs> Um, I told him that the weather in October is like it is all year round. And I also told him you all tithe. So don't disappoint me. Uh, we're real excited. <laughs> we're real excited about it. We uh, took the congregational workshop very seriously that we did uh, almost a year ago. And that was part of our, our search and our interview process was what did we generate in there? So uh, while you have not had direct input into our interviews, you had direct input into why we're here with that. So continue your prayers, come. He's looking forward to hearing lots of y'alls and smiles and everything, so we're real excited about it. Come see me. The other thing is if you know people who have not been able to come recently because of COVID or other thing, reach out to them and call them and check on them and say, you know, this is an opportunity to meet him in a small group. It's very, very important. So, thank you. So remember, shh. <laughs> you know what was really funny about what you said? When I was interviewed for my first intentional interim, which was in Houston, it was in October. <laughs> and they said, the weather here is this way all year <laughs> round. <laughs> So I believe that to be true. <laughs> Other announcements? Of course, we have Bible class this morning. I hope you'll join us for that as we continue looking at the attributes of God. Uh, you might have some questions about the, uh, the festivals that we talked about, and we might be able to talk about that a little bit as well. Any other announcements we need to make for this morning? If not, then let's continue with the post-communion canticle.
receive now the blessing of Almighty God. The Lord is blessing you and keeping you. The Lord is making his face to shine on you and is being gracious to you. The Lord is looking upon you with favor and giving you his peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.